I'll go live when I see this. Okay. Tash Dile, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers and to our lovely live audience tuning from across the globe. Uh, welcome to the virtual event of Freedom R, an online discussion hosted by Asia Freedom Institute, which is a nonprofit organization that calls for uh, democracy and religious freedom in Tibet and China. I'm Sakina Bhatt, the moderator for Asia Freedom Institute's uh, Freedom R. Uh, today marks the 34th birthday of Gyanden Chukinima, the 11th Pension Lama. We'd like to wish him a very happy birthday. Unfortunately, we do not know if he's even alive since his abduction uh, by the Chinese government at the age of only six after His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, recognized him as the 11th Pension Lama. Today, we will discuss on the topic if the 11th Pension Lama is the youngest uh, or, and, and the longest serving Tibetan political prisoner. And joining us for the discussion, we have uh, Garnet Genuis, a Canadian politician who is currently a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Immigration Committee. I've had the honor of sharing the screen with uh, Sisur Losan Singela quite uh, many times now, and I'm so happy to do that again. Uh, Sisul Lofsang Singela is a Tibetan political leader who has served as the first Sikyong of Central Tibetan Administration and is an expert on Tibet, China, and international human rights law. We have Rajiv Mehrotra, a founder and honorary managing trustee of Foundation for Universal Responsibility. He has been a student for His Holiness the Dalai Lama for 40 years. We have Nangsil, uh, Nangsil Dewa from New York, who will be joining us in the latter half of the discussion. She is the grandniece of uh, Chadur Rinpoche, who has led the search committee uh, for the 11th Pension Lama. And uh, finally, we have Kedor La. Uh, Kedor Okotsang is the founder and president of Asia Freedom Institute. He is the senior non-resident fellow at Atlantic Council Global China Hub. So let me quickly run through the agenda for today. So firstly, we will be starting off with one general question, and you have three minutes each uh, to give your answers. And then um, it will be followed by a video message by Zika Rinpoche. And, uh, and then it will be followed by first individual questions for all the first, all the three speakers. Unfortunately, Bob is not here with us. He's not feeling so well. Uh, so for that also, you have three minutes each, followed by a video by uh, from Nuri Turkil. And then uh, we will uh, move forward with the second individual questions. And for that also, you have three minutes each. And then finally, we will have uh, two individual questions for Nangsala. And I'd like to request all our speakers to please uh, stick to the um, time limit uh, when you give your answers. Uh, so before we commence with the discussion, um, I would like to uh, present, we would like to present a 30 seconds preview of a documentary on uh, the 11th Pension Lama. Uh, the video produced by Asia Freedom Institute was released this morning at 9 a.m. Lhasa timing. Hope you enjoy. Uh, can we please have the video, please? Thank you so much uh, for the video. And, uh, and if you want to watch the entire video, it's available on Asia Freedom Institute's Facebook, YouTube, and uh, Twitter. So without further ado, I would now like to hand over the discussion to Kedor Okatsang. Um, uh, he will be moderating today's uh, discussion. Over to you, Kedor La. Uh, Kedor La, you need to unmute.
Uh, thank you, Sakina, and good morning and welcome to all our viewers. And also, thank you very much to all the speakers who are joining us this morning. Uh, and before I proceed, I wanted to just uh, uh, send my best wishes to Bob. He just came back from Bob Thurman. He just came back from India, and uh, I was just informed that he's not feeling well. So we all wish him a very uh, speedy and complete recovery. And uh, since we have so much to discuss today, uh, let's just get right into it. Uh, so today is Gendun uh, Choki Nima, the 11th Pension Lama's uh, 34th birthday. And, uh, you know, he's been missing since uh, the last 28 years. And this is something really hard to really wrap your head around because how can someone, not just one individual, but also his entire family, go missing and uh, remain missing for this long in a country which has a population of over 1.2 billion. Uh, so this is something which, uh, for me personally, I still find quite hard to accept and comprehend. But that is the sad uh, situation. So today is a very, very special day. And I want to open up our discussion uh, this morning by just asking our expert panelists here to share their thoughts on the importance of today uh, and why the case and the situation with regards to the Levin Pension Lama is uh, important. And, uh, and what can we and what can the world do to really bring more attention, more awareness, and how can we uh, pressure the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party to release uh, both the Levin Pension Lama and his family and uh, and how can we just say yeah, create create a great awareness and and just bring bring uh, and mobilize more support? So I know Garnet, uh, you don't have a lot of time with us. So why don't I start with you and then we'll just uh, take it from there? So it's uh, over to you, Garnet. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor for me to be included in this important conversation. I want to say hello to my fellow panelists and to friends around the world who are. Uh, who are allies in, in the important fight for, for justice and human rights uh, in Tibet. Uh, today is, is an important day, as, as was mentioned, the Pension Lama's 34th birthday. Uh, and uh, I, I do want to wish him a happy birthday and, and uh, my, my best wishes uh, in the context of a terrible situation, which, as, as was mentioned, he and his family have been up, abducted. So the, the question for us uh, is what we can do as as experts, as activists, as legislators around the world. Uh, and uh, I think it's important to, to see in this context the way that the government of China uses arbitrary detention. And this is part of the uh, the communist system of, of denying the dignity and value of the individual uh, and uh, treating individuals instead as as mere instruments in the pursuit of state policy instead of as uh, as uh, as ends, as 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 uh, creatures of inherent worth and dignity in and of themselves. Um, uh, and the, the Pension Lama, of course, uh, has a particular significance uh, for the, the Buddhist and the Tibet community. Um, we, we need to continue to talk about this case. We need to continue to speak out and highlight uh, the case, to continue to call for his release. Uh, we need to continue to speak against uh, the the uh, policies of unjust and arbitrary detention uh, that are uh, pursued um, that are pursued by the government of uh, of, of China, uh, and above all, we need to be always telling the truth. Uh, as I think the the Chinese government uh, projects lies, they want us to uh, to ignore realities and and give in to their narrative. Uh, and in response to that, we need to to insist on truth as a critical uh, weapon against tyranny, uh, and that means. Um, that means uh, speaking about the fact that Tibetans are a people, that Tibetans have a right to self-determination, uh, that it is the um, it, it is through the the procedures that have been established by the Tibetan people that lamas are selected, not through the uh, not through the decisions of a uh, of a, an officially atheist political party. Uh, so we need to. Continue to highlight this case, speak about this case, uh, and to recognize the importance of, of speaking truth in general uh, as, a, as a weapon against tyranny. Those would be my initial thoughts. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Garnet. Uh, so, Lopsanla, your thoughts? Uh, thank you, Kedo, and uh, thank you, Sakina. Good to see uh, my old friend, uh, 
Rajiv Merota and Ghana Guinness, you know, uh, hopefully, Rajiv, we just met recently briefly in Delhi. Hopefully, Ghana, I get to come to Ottawa and see you in person. And thank you for passing the motion on Tibet. You know, we you visited Dharamsala, you promised to your solidness, uh, you do something about Tibet. And, you know, through your action, uh, you have clearly indicated your strong support uh, for Tibet. Now, as for Pinchin Lama, I think we can get into details. But generally, you know, China wants to be number one in the world by 1949. They have declared so that's the 100th anniversary of Communist Party of China. And then they want to uh, project themselves as this benign power. For example, one narrative they say is we never invaded any other country. Hence, we will not invade Taiwan. But case of Tibet and Xinjiang and Inner Mongolia and in, I mean, historically speaking, Manchuria also prove them wrong. And when it comes to trade dispute uh, with America, they say, why not we resolve this through dialogue, right? And what we have been saying, Benjamin Lama disappeared at the age of six. For almost 30 years, we've been saying through dialogue, why don't you release Benjamin Lama? He has right to have teachers. He has right to have monastery. He has right to meet with his parents regularly when he wishes, right to meet with his siblings, right? Just single boy at the age of six has disappeared. It's almost 30 years that he has disappeared. Now, Chinese government doesn't want to engage in dialogue, doesn't want, for example, they are offering, uh, you know, a kind of peace initiative in Ukraine, which is good, whatever peace initiative towards Tibetans. I mean, when the Chinese government doesn't resolve a case of a single boy who has resolved, who Chinese government doesn't want to engage in dialogue with us, doesn't want to initiate peace with us. That you know, pricks the credibility. So Pension Lama, the issue of Pension Lama also reflects how hardliner, how unreasonable Chinese government is. So when they talk about peace in Ukraine or dialogue with you know, America in resolving the you know, trade issues or with Europe, they all should remind that what about a case of a single boy, Benjamin Lama. So that way, Benjamin Lama reflects the gravity of situation in Tibet. Thank you. Thank you, Lopsanla. Uh, Rajiv, your thoughts on this? Well, on this birthday, I you know, feel a deep sense of uh, anguish. Uh, at uh, the predicament of a young boy um, who through no sort of uh, uh, fault or responsibility of his own, per se, uh, was identified as the Panchen Lama. And so he has gotten caught in the ambitions and the totalitarianism and the intolerance uh, of uh, the Chinese government. And for me, that is the primary tragedy today that it should happen to anyone. And uh, it is a human story, regardless of its political implications. And of course, that doesn't undermine uh, the political narrative and the implications of the Chinese actions in terms of what they have uh, done to the Panchen Lama. I think uh, in, and, and, and there are obviously two dimensions uh, to this in terms of the politics of it. Uh, is that uh, the significance of the Panchen Lama's role in the identification of the Dalai Lama. And so uh, one of the major objectives here, obviously, uh, is to uh, see how they can uh, ensure uh, that they have more clout in controlling that process. Uh, and the second, of course, is their innate uh, uh, you know, sense of uh, being threatened uh, by anything that uh, the Dalai Lama may have initiated or may have endorsed. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we have to accept uh, with, with sort of deep regret that the international community's efforts uh, to influence the Chinese government on human rights and situations uh, uh, such as these have fallen dramatically and significantly short. This does not mean that we just give up our efforts and... Uh, uh, to advocate for change. And there are several, several reasons why we should continue to push uh, for change in human rights in China, not just because of the uh, Tibetans, but of the many other minorities uh, 
uh, in China and the Chinese people themselves who confront and live uh, with so much um, uh, repression and lack of fundamental freedoms. And, uh, and, and very often we tend to make this an issue of uh, the Panchen Lama and the Dalai Lama. But I think it is also a question of uh, not just Tibet, but Tibet's civilizational heritage, which is of such enormous value and relevance to the rest of the world. And I think uh, an, an issue that came up for me, I was in, uh, in, uh, in Geneva in, I think it was October, when there was this meeting on the uh, sidelines of the uh, uh, the meeting, uh, the UN meeting on on on, uh, on human rights, and I was appalled that uh, the issue of succession was referred to by a very senior U.S. official as being sort of obscure, exotic, and mystical, and that we should respect and accept these, even though it represented these facets or qualities. And while it may be difficult to understand and appreciate this, I think it's very important that uh, in our campaign, we are clear and, and, and people understand uh, why uh, the Tibetans follow a system of uh, a succession that draws on reincarnation, what is its value, its significance, and logic. And so it's not just something that's sort of... Uh, remote and magical happening out there. And uh, so we should just honor it because it's something the Tibetans uh, feel strongly about. I think there is a much larger significance in not uh, intruding or in interfering with what you may not completely be able to understand. And we have seen that happen in the recent, uh, uh, in a quite uncalled for and unnecessary uh, controversy uh, about His Holiness's own uh, uh, you know, engaging uh, with great warmth, love, and affection with a boy. Uh, and so I think that, you know, we, too, we need to recognize what the resistors uh, to the uh, appreciation are beyond the conventional uh, uh, vocabulary, which has almost become rhetorical, that, oh, we must stand up for human rights, we must stand up for X, Y, X, y Z, but I think we must stand up uh, for uh, a civilization uh, an inheritance of that civilization that adds value not just to the Tibetan people, but to all mankind. Uh, thank you, Rajiv. Very eloquently said. Uh, so next we have a very short video message from Zigyab uh, Tugu. Uh, Zigyab Rinpoche is the abbot of uh, the Tashilimpo Monastery located in southern India. Uh, Rumiche very much wanted to be with us this morning, but he is currently in the UK, and he and his monastery, uh, they have been tirelessly campaigning for the release and uh, the freedom of Pinjir uh, uh, Rumiche. So here is uh, Rumiche's uh, message. ตัวเนี่ยคุณสิเป็นเจริญมุจิกินเนตุนปอเลยอ่ะตัวเลนโกติน่าชาบะติเดชะเดชะเตนเดอินดูท้องมาตัวเลนเดริเพมเกนกุ
Pinse Pinsu Yang Sing Minsin Nang Reki Tawaso Kiche Lugu Rang Shida Matin Chi Chan De Yuare Tetsam Do Masebe Kunsi Pinsi Kuti Chuba Chimbo Chan Higan Pregi Chudari Shuki Ida Chibi Chi Chetum Kule Tseme Kyan Nang Batang Mataya Kuso Tsun Jie Kyan Nang Miri Gi Chetum Lodong Chimbo Zen Nang Yuare Yunzente Dalak Dene, Shunda Shundre Mayimbe, Sopo Tangmegi, Tabardo Mushu Gusumne, Gabjordan, Lingu Naman Bevalia, Jesu Yirantan, Tadun, Gunzi Benjamin Major, Nedin Tajo Majungi Pardo, Nalel Ha Gabjordan, Lingu Naman. Bezu, Loba Meva, Nanro Shuguin Tadu, Geno Consecam, which Macho, Cosin Shabby, Kaja Dinge, two shilling, you do Batang Gunsi Penjan, which a county knew the Ludo Torche Geno Consecam, which Macho, Kumba County over to Tabdang Okay, so uh, so this is the message from uh, Zigyo to Go, and uh, and now we'll go into the the individual round of questions for our participants. And I know Garnet, you have to leave us uh, shortly. So why don't I start off with you first? And uh, this is an organization, Garnet, that you're familiar with. Uh, so this is the uh, the Angus Reed Institute. And earlier in February, they did a a survey on China amongst uh, uh, Canadian citizens. And uh, according to the survey, Garnet, uh, as much as 40% uh, of Canadians uh, saw China as a threat, and 12% uh, actually identified Beijing as an enemy. Uh, I'm just wondering how what's kind of driving this you know such negative perception of china amongst canadians and how much of a factor is really uh china's policy with regards to you know human rights religious freedom and the repression of uh, the tibetans the Uyghurs, the mongolians uh, uh brothers and sisters from hong kong so how much of that is really driving this uh negative perception of china and in addition what can the Canadian government and the Canadian Parliament do to to really uh, change the situation, right? To attention on uh, Pension Lama uh, and his uh, and his release, as well as also how can we, how can the Canadian government and Canadian Parliament uh, discourage uh, the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party from using religion as well as the uh, entire reincarnation process in Tibetan Buddhism as a political tool. So if uh, if you could, yeah, uh, address those uh, questions. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So in, in terms of the, the negative perceptions issues, uh, those of us in, in politics uh, here, are, you know, who are who are on this side of the issue in terms of justice and human rights are always very judicious in the language we use. Uh, I have a positive view of Chinese civilization, of the Chinese people, uh, but certainly a very negative view of communism and of the uh, uh, the way that the CCP operates in in, in particular. Um, so I, I think that that's an important caveat just in the in the discussion of 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 the polling. But uh, there there is a, a a heightened negative perception of the communist uh, regime. Uh, the CCP. And uh, I think a, a big turning point in, in that perception issue was Canada's own uh, issues around arbitrary detention. Uh, there were two very uh, highly publicized and widely discussed cases of two Canadians, Michael Koberg and Michael Spavor, who were arbitrarily detained in China. Uh, and um, and I think the, the the Chinese government's perception may have been that after they were released, everything would 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 be fine. But uh, that 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 was clearly not how it worked. That that people who who when your citizens are arbitrarily detained as as uh, bargaining chips in the mind of that that foreign regime, uh, that will forever change 
the way that Canadians who remember these events uh, perceive the attitude of the uh, of the communist regime. And uh, I think, you know, as we talk about the, the situation of the Panchen Lama and others, it's just important to uh, to continually remind people that there are many more facing arbitrary detention in China. Uh, there are other Canadians, such as Hussein Chalil, that remain in arbitrary yeah. detention. Uh, and there are uh, there are non-Canadians like the like the Panchen Lama. Uh, Excuse me. Uh, it, and um, just a couple points to add, though, that have shaped perception here in Canada. Uh, right now, a big focus of the discussion is on uh, foreign interference in Canada. Uh, it's it's on the efforts by the Chinese communist uh, regime to uh, influence affairs here in Canada and threaten our own sovereignty. And this is get, getting a lot of discussion, an issue of significant sensitivity. And the, the Tibet community and other diaspora communities in, in Canada have been particular victims of this. Uh, there are cases of Tibetan Canadians, such as uh, Chimi Lamo, who have faced threats and intimidation here in Canada. Canada as a result of their uh, their involvement in uh, the cause, uh, the, the Tibetan cause. Um, and Canada was also the first country where Parliament adopted a motion recognizing the Uyghur genocide. So uh, we have played an important role, Canada's Parliament has, in prosecuting the case regarding the Uyghur genocide. It was a Canadian parliamentary committee that first made that recognition, and the Canadian House of Commons was the first legislative body to do that. So uh, the C Canadians are concerned about uh, arbitrary detention issues, foreign interference issues, and uh, and the the ongoing genocide that's happening inside of China. Uh, there are there are many other issues that have gotten uh, some some attention, uh, but I think those have been the the issues that have most shaped perception. Now, as it relates to uh, religious freedom and in, interference around uh, uh, around uh, the reincarnation issue. Um, uh, Canada is a relatively secular society, uh, which means that, uh, uh, you know, it's it's important for our, our parliamentary institutions to be informed about how these religious dynamics are informing uh, oppression and violence. Uh, we previously had something called the Office of Religious Freedom here in Canada. Uh, and, and my party, I would like to see Canada bring back an Office of Religious Freedom that can fight for religious freedom specifically, but, but is also just uh, able to bring that understanding of dynamics of religious persecution, issues that uh, people who aren't as familiar with, with Buddhism may not instinctively understand, but are certainly very important elements of the, of the oppression uh, that we see. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Garnet. Uh, so if I can next uh, ask uh, Losanla. So, I was wondering if you could share with us uh, what can Tibetans and uh, Tibetan supporters take away and learn from the entire experience with regards to the uh, reincarnation and selection process of the 11th Pension Lama? And more specifically, can you share with us kind of your thoughts on how the Chinese government has really handled this whole issue and how are they explaining and uh, uh, you know, in terms of the whereabouts of the 11th Pension Lama, uh, especially given the fact that the Chinese government, you know, is an atheist, uh, atheist government, does not believe in religion. So what's, yeah, what has been the approach and, uh, and how, how, how have they really um, kind of addressed this whole issue? And most importantly, yeah, what are the lessons we can actually take away from this? Uh, lessons are, I think, simple um, and generic. And number one, the Communist Party of China is an authoritarian system. They want control, you know. For example, as far as uh, Gendun Chigunyuma, the 11th Benchen Lama is concerned, it was, you know, the Chinese Communist Party established a selection committee headed by Chadir Buche of Tashinubo Monastery. And they went and searched, and finally they found candidates and finally, they narrowed down to three, and three no the nominees of the three, one in the Gendushu Ginyima, was indicated as the 11th Pension Lama and sent to His Holiness the Lama for consultation and endorsement. And His Holiness the Lama said, yes, these are the three candidates, and yes, the one you are indicating seems to be right. And His Holiness did his spiritual responsibility that is to perform divination consult oracles and finally 
His Holiness the Lama endorsed Levin Pension Lama, selected by the selection committee appointed by the Chinese government. This is very important. We often say, oh, Dalai Lama selected the Levin Pension Lama. No, Dalai Lama endorsed the Levin Pension Lama, submitted by the selection committee of the Chinese government. Now, just because it was endorsed by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, Chinese government felt, especially Communist Party, they are losing control. And they kidnapped the boy, and he has disappeared since. Now, in his place, Gen Zinubu is appointed now. So he asked me the question, what, why, you know, uh, they are doing so? Because they don't respect religion. They believe religion is poison. As you say, Communist Party is an atheist organization. They want to play with religion. They want to minimize, dilute, and destroy religion, Buddhism, which is the source of our civilization and our Tibetan national identity. Hence, they are making a puppet uh, of, you know, um, against the Nobu. So this is how they misplayed or misuse their authority. Otherwise, you know, one wise thing they could have done is when His Holiness Dalai Lama endorsed the 11 Pension Lama, Chinese government could have accepted that because they were, all, they were going to be in physical control of Levin Pension Lama. They would have gotten the genuine Pension Lama in their hands, right, with the endorsement of the uh, 14th Dalai Lama. That could have played a very important role. I think we will discuss about reincarnation because Pension Lamas plays an important role as far as reincarnation or selection of reincarnation of Dalai Lama is concerned. Now imagine they could have had Gendin Shirgi Nyema, 11th Pension Lama, endorsed by the Dalai Lama, selecting or endorsing the 15th Dalai Lama physically inside China in their hands. So they lost it. They miscalculated and they made a terrible mistake. Now they have Genzen Nobu, who lacks credibility in the eyes of Tibetan people and Buddhists at large, right, who is thrown, pushed forward to play a spiritual role. And we don't blame Genzen Nobu. I mean, again, like Rajiv said, he is also uh, a, a boy, young boy, caught in this, you know, uh, uh, what do you call, spiritual, you know, uh, action, so to speak. And we don't blame Genzen Nobu per se, but definitely he is in the control of the Communist Party of China and he is being, you know, misused. So these are the lessons we should learn. Uh, thank you, Rosanna. Uh, Rajiv, as you know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, has been living in India for the last 23 years. Uh, and really, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, India has been his home. Uh, and uh, given this, what's your sense of how Indians view uh, the whole system of uh, reincarnation in Tibetan Buddhism, especially the reincarnation of uh, some of the high Tibetan religious figures like the Dalai Lamas and the Pension Lamas. And then what's your view on what the Indian government and the people of India can do to advance the issue of the 11th Pension Lama in terms of uh, finding about his whereabouts, uh, securing his release and freedom? And uh, and what can, what can the government of India and people of India do to really put pressure or to educate or to raise awareness about the Chinese government's effort to control uh, the whole tradition and process of reincarnation in Tibetan Buddhism? Ah, that's many questions rolled into one. And I can uh, I really, I, I, I want to draw a distinction between uh, what the people of India and the manner in which they uh, uh, have publicly and with the greatest uh, warmth, affection, reverence and respect uh, related uh, and celebrated the Dalai Lama at every turn. And I think that it is one of the great success stories in human history of a refugee community um, maintaining their traditions and identity and while remaining uh, welcomed by their hosts you know, that many decades into exile. And I think uh, great credit goes to the leadership of His Holiness, uh, the, the vision of the Indian leadership, 
certainly in the early years and subtextually in uh, in later years and the people of india and so i think that is a uh, that is a complete no brainer uh, in terms of the manner in which uh, india truly celebrates uh, the dalai lama and the tibetans and has the great you know, feels a great privilege and blessing uh, that the Tibetan community and the Dalai Lama are with India. Um, I think the the, the challenge, um, uh, you know, really has been, uh, the, you know, for India, uh, you know, sharing a border with China, and in what has been essentially an unequal relationship, uh, militarily and economically, uh, to be able to uh, assert themselves, uh, you know, from the distance that say the united states or canada uh, enjoys in the in, in the more aggressive articulated positions that they and and the europeans are able to take uh, so i think that you know that has been a big uh, issue and, uh, and 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 we have always believed that the dalai lama was one of our own and who brought buddhism back uh, to the land of the buddha's birth so that's a very fundamental elemental kind of relationship uh, with the Dalai Lama, uh, and, uh, and that survives and uh, will survive. At the same time, I think that from the Tibetan perspective, there are serious, uh, you know, issues and concerns. Uh, you know, the Indian community is sort of, uh, you know, wondering have they not done enough, and what might they have done? That the popu the Tibetan population in India is shrinking. What are its implications? Uh, for the future of the Tibetan uh, agenda and the Tibetan cause. There are numerous uh, issues uh, about the future that you mentioned of uh, uh, the succession and the reincarnation of uh, his uh, uh, successor to His Holiness uh, that have remained unresolved and not addressed uh, from the nitty gritty of uh, who will manage uh, the transition as and when it occurs, it's uh, who will help ensure its authenticity, the the legal quagmire that it might in involve, and I think it's time that uh, the, the Indians and the Tibetans uh, got together with confidentiality and some discretion, because it must be enormously embarrassing uh, for His Holiness uh, to be constantly confronted with the question about his succession. Uh, and then he has often said that, look, everybody else seems much more worried about this than I am. And when the time comes, I will decide. And we have to, of course, respect that, but also follow a, 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 a middle path uh, on, on in, in, in that realm of uh, engagement. And uh, in, in terms of the specifics, and like, like I was going to say that, of the disappearance of the Panchen Lama, uh, I think that uh, again uh, the Indian government and on all sides, if you look at the issue of the Karmapa, uh, was and has been very poorly handled uh, uh, in, in in the manner that uh, you know he has now uh, left India, and I don't want to go into the details of what may or may not have happened uh, behind the scenes uh, within India and within his followers, and. Uh, uh, so I think that uh, you know has raised a, a serious question mark in public perception about uh, how the Indian state uh, recognizes and treats uh, senior lamas, and the Karmapa certainly had the endorsement of His Holiness himself, uh, and and yet uh, things were allowed to uh, uh, sort of unfold in a manner that no one found uh, welcome or desirable. And I don't want to preempt your next question, but and then go deeper into uh, into the issue of uh, uh, reincarnation. But I would really like to see, and uh, you know, the government of India uh, give in what in a, I don't say this as a student of His Holiness, in what really is the Dalai Lama's due uh, for who he is, not just uh, in terms of uh, uh, how his presence in India may be a political asset. And I hate the word that people often use uh, when they talk about the Dalai Lama card. I mean, it must. Be, I mean, I find it completely repugnant that a person of the stature of the, His Holiness should be referred to as a card or an asset uh, you know, to be used. 
I was deeply disappointed that the uh, when uh, in the recent Buddhist summit where Lok Sang and I were both present, that this was, I thought, an amazing opportunity for the Prime Minister of India, who was meeting and addressing Buddhist leaders from across the world, uh, and that the preeminent Buddhist leader was not amongst them. Uh, and I, it, 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 I, I was deeply disappointed and distressed uh, that that happened. And I can, uh, and I just say this purely in an individual capacity, uh, that I'm extremely distressed that uh, it may have, you know, it may have rocked the boat a little bit. But after all, you know, we have always said that uh, His Holiness is an honored guest of India and we host him as an eminent religious leader. And this was an opportunity uh, to publicly uh, embrace him in a sense, uh, at least on par, uh, if not way beyond the other uh, you know, Buddhist leaders from other countries. There are some sort of reassuring um, gestures you know, the announcement of setting up a Dalai Lama center for the promotion of and uh, preservation of India's civilizational values uh, in Bodh Gaya. And should that substantially take over, uh, take on and, 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 and sort of uh, take off, uh, I think will be a very useful contribution. I do believe, again, uh, I seem to believe everything about His Holiness with great passion, uh, that it's very important that we engage in Dalai Lama studies, that we begin to honor and study the Dalai Lama as an academic enterprise, like we study Mahatma Gandhi and, and whoever else, Jesus Christ or, or the Buddha, uh, to start doing academic research uh, on him. So while a great deal has been done uh, and, and the fundamentals have been sound, that we were welcome the Tibetan people, the Indian, Indian government gave them land, set up uh, in educational institutions for the Tibetans, set up monasteries, but it's also sad to see them shutting down. And I think that has huge uh, consequences and implications. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, next, I'm pleased to present this uh, short video message from Nuri Turkal. Uh, Nuri Turkal is the chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious uh, Freedom, and he was appointed as a commissioner uh, by the then Speaker of the House, uh, Nancy Pelosi, in mid-2020. Uh, and Nuri has testified before the U.S. Congress, speaking about uh, Uyghur internment camps and uh, advocating a legislative response to China's atrocities. Uh, his policy recommendations have incorporated to U.S. law and uh, pending bills uh, related to Uyghurs and China. And he's also a senior fellow at the Washington think tank, the Hudson Institute. So let me yeah, uh, just quickly present to you uh, the message from Nuri. Freedom Institute for inviting me to speak, and I regret that I could not join you in person for today's important event. We are gathering to honor the 11th Panchen Lama, recognized by the Dalai Lama, who turns 34 years old today. The Chinese Communist Party forcibly disappeared him in 1995 when he was only six years old, making him one of the world's longest held prisoners of conscience. We at USERP remain deeply concerned about his well-being and will continue to advocate for his freedom. USERP is also broadly concerned about the worsening religious freedom conditions in Tibet and throughout China. The CCP has stepped up the repression of Tibetan Buddhists, Uyghurs, other Turkic Muslims, Christians, and others, all in the name of sinicization of religion. Religion constitutes an integral part of Tibetan and Uyghur ethno-religious identities. For this reason, the CCP spares no effort to eradicate the religious influence of Tibetan Buddhism and Islam in the lives of Tibetans and Uyghurs. In Tibet, the CCP bans religious gatherings, 
destroys important sacred sites and symbols, and put Tibetan monks and nuns in so-called re-education centers for political indoctrination with the intent to destroy their religious and ethnic identity. It detains Tibetan Buddhists who revere the Dalai Lama and listen to his teachings. And ironically, the ACCCP regime even wants to control who gets reincarnated and succeeds the current Dalai Lama. The CCP's persecution has led some Tibetans to self-immolate and protest the increasingly repressive policies implemented in Tibet, claiming at least three lives in 2022 alone. As a member of the UN Security Council and Human Rights Council, China has repeatedly failed to uphold its international obligations. Even worse, it uses its influence in the UN to subvert the international human rights law system and attempt to alter the definition of human rights. It also engages in transnational repression, targeting Tibetan and Uyghur activists living in the diaspora. We must continue to consistently and clearly call out the CCP's religious freedom violations and other human rights abuses. And the United States government and its like-minded international partners must confront and hold the Chinese government accountable. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Chair uh, Nuri Turkal. Uh, so if I could go back to you, uh, Sr. Lozana, uh, as you know, the Chinese government came out with their order number five directive in 2007. And there are a number of measures in there, including uh, requiring, you know, uh, official registration and approval of all uh, Tibetan Tukus, uh, reincarnate monks. Um, did we just lose uh, Lozana? I think uh, maybe I'll go back to you, uh, Rajiv. Uh, sure. I mean, you spoke about uh, His Holiness's, you know, importance and why uh, his reincarnation matters. But I wanted to just ask you, in terms of this concept of reincarnation and how we really explain and educate the public around this. Uh, I mean, do you do you see, in addition to this being an issue of religious freedom, are there other ways to educate uh, the public and the citizenry on why this uh, is important, why it needs to be supported? Well, you know, in, in, uh, I, I think it needs to be uh, supported uh, because it is a system and it's difficult for us to do this. We have to what we call um uh, respond to what are the resistors to change or what are the doubts and confusions that people have and some of the typical ones are uh you know that stands in gatso who reincarnates what is reincarnation what aspect uh reincarnates uh and, and this happened uh, you know in the case of the karmapa that the reincarnation of the Karmapa was in India and uh, uh, another Karmapa uh, was identified. And I will not get into the politics of it. And then interestingly, uh, the two met uh, in Paris and shook hands and said, OK, we are united in what we do. So I think we need to be able to articulate as best we can because we are working in a different uh, cultural, social political climate uh, where and you know there is the emphasis on democracy and so the question we need to ask ourselves is what are the questions that people are asking about the legitimacy uh, of reincarnation and we have to work hard to develop a narrative that will explain this uh, so that we can get uh, credible and substantial support for example, I think there is something very important uh, that His Holiness has uh, done, and uh, that is by handing over uh, political authority to people like Lopsang Sangila, Pampala, whoever it is. He has demonstrated that this is not a question of affirming political power. And so that's a very important message that has emanated, that this is not like the kings uh, who sort of the eldest son gets you know, appointed and then it, it's more like uh, 
uh, you know, there is the element of the sacred and which is subtle, which we may not be able to always articulate and define. And hence, it's important. I mean, there are many other questions is that, I mean, there have been instances of reincarnation turning rogue. Uh, so what are the, you know, the mechanisms that will help us uh, ensure this doesn't happen? I think we need to move beyond, you know, the rhetorical. And I see a lot of rhetoric. I was, you know, researching this about the same thing. We're talking about human rights, talking about da 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 But unless we really look at the prejudices, the concerns, and the doubts of people, we may not be able to respond to all of them. I mean, I just think across the table, even some of these things come up for me, and I just think I should think about it in, in, in greater detail myself as a, you know, as... And, uh, you know, you've called me somewhere a friend. I'm not a friend of the Dalai Lama. I am his chela. I am his student. I do not consider myself a friend uh, because that is a relationship of some kind of uh, equality. And so there is an element of faith uh, involved in it. And we really need to work hard to build a narrative. And what is the guarantee, uh, for example? I mean, a question that I would ask uh, if, if I was sitting on the other side of the fence, that uh, that we will be able to manage uh, in exile, uh, the grooming and training of the Dalai Lama for 25 years. What if that new, you know, the, the, he, he doesn't have the charisma of the current, uh, you know, Dalai Lama to be able to, you know, exercise uh, the same kind of uh, influence that the present Dalai Lama has done. So, I mean, it, it, it all begins, I think, with asking, trying to ask uh, the right questions. And we can never find the perfect answers. And, and many of them are dependent on faith. And even in, in, in science, there are many acts of faith that we, you know, we don't always completely understand some facet. But I think it's crucial uh, that we, you know, we begin that process. And I think we're just leaving too many things to broad, you know, uh, generalizations. And I think that needs to be addressed. Uh, sorry, Lok Sangla, I grabbed you. You disappeared and I grabbed your space. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you, Rajiv. You can replace me so, anytime. It's not. No, 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 no. <laughs> so, to Sisul Alosana, I wanted to ask you about, you know, as you are well aware, in uh, 2007, the Chinese government came out with this Order Number no. 5 directive, which, among other things, uh, requires, you know, official approval, kind of registration of all uh, tukus, uh, reincarnate uh, Tibetan. Uh, spiritual uh, figures and also there's a database that the authorities maintain and more recently the government has also announced or is planning to announce additional administrative measures in uh, quote-unquote places of worship right where believe it or not they are also planning on making uh, CC, uh, CCP propaganda mandatory in all these places of worship so I just wanted to hear from you in terms of if you could share with the viewers your thoughts on on um, what's driving this and uh, and how this increasing control fits in with the larger Chinese effort to you know control and kind of uh, use this for their broader kind of uh, uh, policy and you know strategic kind of outcomes and also if I could ask you something which I just uh, earlier asked yeah, Rajiv, you already asked four questions in that. No, but let me let me just uh, run through it so that you can take your time in uh, in answering these. <laughs> but as you know, uh, you know the reincarnation is such an important topic for Tibetans and Tibet supporters. So, lastly, yeah, uh, if can you share your thoughts on how this could be framed in other ways? You know, beyond just uh, this being an issue of religious freedom. As I said, you know. It's an authoritarian system, Communist Party is, and hence they want to have control. They don't want to lose control. And this obsession for control comes from underlying fear or mistrust towards Tibetans, right? So that's why, why they're coming out with order number five. They want to control reincarnation. Can you imagine Tibet has been under the illegal occupation of Tibet, uh, China for 70 years? Okay, they have physically controlled Tibet. They have, you know, effectively, you know, replaced every Tibetan official possible in military, intelligence, civil, you just name it, party. They have absolute control of everything. Even then, they have come out with order number five in 2007, 
which means right, they are trying to synthesize Buddhism. And hence, we must understand that their overarching goal is to make Tibet or convert Tibet into a Chinatown, you know, or Chinese province. Make Tibetans into Chinese, even Buddhism into a Chinese Buddhism, meaning secular, atheistic, you know, kind of a, can you imagine, can, religion cannot be atheistic, but in a way, they are trying to make that, you know, so they want control. Um, so this is the underlying problem. Now, as far as reincarnation is concerned, it's ridiculous that the Chinese government want to have any say or have any role in reincarnation. The fact that, look at the incident with the boy and the Dalai Lama, the Chinese blogger, right? They misuse it. They manipulate it to defame what His Holiness has built for 87 years, his credibility, his moral authority. He's respected around the world for what? He has nothing. He's just a simple monk, right? He doesn't have power, but he built it. What did he build? Moral character, moral authority, a spiritual leader, a guru, right? With credibility. And recently the boy and the Solon's incident was manipulated by the Chinese government because there's underlying mistrust. They want to have control. They want to destroy his credibility. Obviously, they will not succeed with that because the Solon is, for us, is a manifestation of, you know, uh, a Buddha of compassion. Similarly, on reincarnation, they will not succeed for several reasons. Number one, they are an atheist. They destroyed 99% of monasteries and nunneries. They destroyed 99% by 9% of monks and nuns. They looted, plundered, sold our Tibetan artifacts and statues, gold and silver, diamond, you just name it, right? Sold in the black market. Even the uh, statues of artifacts made out of iron and copper were melted and made into utensils, things like that. With that, with that kind of uh, credibility of destructions, right? How can anyone even give them slightest credibility as far as reincarnation is concerned. And for the last 70 years, they have done nothing but criticize His Holiness Dalai Lama, trying to defame him. And the incident with Boy makes it very clear that the Chinese government wants to destroy it. And why, why do they want to do anything with his reincarnation? They want to destroy him again. So they have zero credibility. And as far as Tibetans are concerned, we must, you know, again, learn from what happened recently and be cognizant of the fact that the Chinese government and the Communist Party will always dare to get us. So we must regroup ourselves, unite among ourselves, everybody come together, be alert in defending what is ours. That is the traditional process of reincarnation. And of course, it's an altogether different topic. It needs a lot of time. And I've spoken on this in other you know, panels and forums as well. But I think, yes, this is a major challenge facing us and we should be aware of facing, we should be alert and regroup, reunite, you know, and then you know, under the leadership of Solonis, be very strong. Rajiv wants to replace oh, me thanks. again. No, I just uh, wanted yes, to... Yes, yes, Rajiv. Yeah, I, 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 I'm always upset and disappointed when anybody says this is only a matter uh, of, of, of of and for and about Tibetans. I think this is a global issue. It is the civilizational heritage is embodied by the Dalai Lama, is a, is a global treasure for the human species. And, and that is the overriding reason. Uh, we don't stand up merely uh, for the political freedoms of Tibet to the Tibetan people, which of course we do, but we stand up because this is something that affects us as a species. And what His Holiness has done he has represented the epitome of human aspiration as to what a human being can be. So he is an example, not just to Tibetans and Tibetan Buddhists, but to all human beings who have humanness in them and have not transcended their, how do I put it? Yes, their, their, their humanity. And I think he brings that together. And that is the obligation. I want to move beyond... The, the limited discourse, which I can understand the passion that the Tibetans feel. But as a citizen of the world, as a human being, I feel that this is uh, equally important 
uh, for the rest of uh, the planet. I, I really want to, I cannot but emphasize that. And I think also that if we begin to present this and strategize this, and that's what I was pointing to initially, that it's not just something which is a quaint practice of the Tibetan people. And so we should allow or encourage them to do so. It is a system that has its inherent values. And the idea of reincarnation is prevails all over India. So this is a system we recognize and accept. And we have to, I'm not the expert, but I'm willing to lend my sort of my, my sort of, how do I put it, expanding uh, um, uh, waistline and, 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 and uh, weight, physical weight to this, is that we really have to develop and, and uh, re-articulate this uh, in, in, in a more aggressive, accessible vocabulary. Because when the minute we say this is purely, it, it's a religious practice, and that is why we should depend it, I don't think that's enough. It is, but I think it's much more than that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Rajiv. So uh, I'm gonna, we just... Yeah, we just learned that Bob is actually with us. Uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I'm there. Uh, I don't know why the light, hello, light is Hello, uh, Bob. Hi, hi. I just... Uh, I just sort of try to put in a short appearance to express my horror at the disappearance of the Pajan Lama. I happen to have gotten just Thank come you. down with COVID <laughs> on my return from India. And so my, <clears throat> my voice is... Uh, Thank you. And I am in a sort of state. However, that doesn't change the fact that it's a typical cruel and horrendous thing that Chinese government has done. And the world should be calling it out. And um, I do have one thing to add, maybe that, that other people don't know, because by some strange happenstance, I was at Lama Lutso, and the Lama who was the head of the committee was looking for the new Pension Lama. And in the early morning, about 3 a.m., on the morning before he left, and he was there were some Chinese secret police type with him. And uh, on the morning, he came over to my tent. Somehow he knew who I was. And he said he wanted me to tell His Holiness that he was doing a genuine search and he would come up with the right person for sure. And then he sneaked away. He didn't want to be seen by his minders talking to me. So that occurred. And, uh, and then subsequently, people, some people, the typical people who always blame the victim. They said that the Dalai Lama made a mistake announcing his choice himself without going through the people, you know, the Chinese people who asked, who actually had asked him to look. They had, you know, sort of secretly or quietly had asked him to take a look. When they started the search, <clears throat> they were not necessarily going to do their stupid thing that they ended up doing. But somehow during the search, they decided to do that. So anyway, there was a message that came through from that same Lama who was the head of the committee. You, you all remember his name. That's right. I, I don't remember his name. I'm too, I'm too old to remember. But I know for a fact that that Lama got a message to his holiness, not through me, but I, I forget how I know it, but I do, to his holiness that if he just informed him and he reported it as his holiness's choice, the Chinese were about to just purposely not follow that choice and pick someone else. So then his holiness was in the bind that the people wouldn't know who was the real person unless he publicly did it since the Chinese committee or whatever it was, other than that Lama had stopped cooperating. So then His Holiness made it public, but he tried to make it through the committee in a proper way first. And, and, uh, and, the, and the Lama said, it, it won't go out. They, they'll bury that recommendation and they'll pick somebody else. So then His Holiness thought the people should know. And he hoped that he didn't, you know, he didn't feel they would be so completely stupid. And the final thing I would say, I had planned to say in this event, is that Initially, maybe the Chinese were looking for a puppet. But by the time the thing concluded, 
they decided they would just have something that would be a, be a loyalty test. And so anyone who wouldn't accept their false choice, they would imprison, kick out of the monastery, persecute, arrest, persecute in some way. So it became like a, a litmus test on, on lamas that they would have to accept on or, or they'd get rid of them. So it no longer served the role of a puppet because nobody would listen to the Lama Zuma, right? And they call, uh, after that, I went to Tibet a number of times yep. and everybody called him Lama Zuma, the fake Lama. You know? So those are the three things I wanted to offer. And I'm sorry, <coughs> my voice. And I'm sorry. I Thank you. Say, Thank okay. you, Bob. Uh, we're so yeah, we're so pleased that you could join us despite you know not feeling well. So really, really appreciate it, and I hope you feel better and you know uh, recover you know fully and uh, very soon. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you all very much. Sorry, I was late. Thank you, Bob. And yeah. uh, I'm in this condition now for four or five days. Supposedly in five days, I have a medicine that is supposed to make me better in five days. It's not too bad. Okay. Yeah. Please feel better soon. Yeah. Thank so you. So fun. I saw everyone recently. This is so fun. Thank you, <laughs> Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Nangsala, we are so pleased that uh, you could be with us. Uh, thank you for your patience. You know, thank you for, you know, uh, staying with us and really looking forward to hearing your views and your exchange with uh, Sakinala. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Kedala, and uh, thank you to all our speakers. You spoke really nicely, and it was really interesting. And uh, Naksala, thank you so much for your patience and for uh, like just being there and uh, listening to the entire conversation. So Naksala, without further ado, um, my first question to you is, in May 1995, when the Chinese government abducted uh, the 11th Pension Lama, there were other Tibetans too uh, who were associated with the search and, had, and who were also sentenced. Uh, and that also included your grandfather, Chajal Rinpoche, who was the head of the uh, search committee, right? So how does it feel, uh, Nangsala, like not knowing the whereabout and the well-being of your grandfather, Cheddar Rinpoche. How is that feeling like? Well, before answering my question, I would like to thank Mr. Gerola Masakina and the Asian Freedom Institution for broadcasting the awareness of His Holiness, the 11th Pension Lama, on his 34th birthday. Thank you so much. And um, it's in my immense honor and privilege to be along with experts, key figures in politics, researchers, and religious leaders here on this panel. Today, I learned a lot about knowledgeable concepts and, and ideologies on the reincarnation, as well as the importance of His Holiness, the 11th Pension Lama, and his entire research committee. So thank you so much. Now, referring back to the first question on how I feel not knowing the well-being and the whereabouts of my grandfather, the Chital Rinpoche, well, the answer is very simple. I feel an immense amount of sadness knowing the fact that the Chital Rinpoche played such an instrumental role in the reincarnation task of His Holiness, the 11th Fenton Lama, helping and working under His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, and just practicing simple Tibetan Buddhism that we have been practicing for over thousands and hundreds of years. This gave the Chinese Communist Party an apparent reason to victimize and abduct my grandfather for six years and three years of deprivational political rights. Yet after serving all these years in the court verdict base in 1997, the well-being and the whereabouts of my grandfather at the age of 84 years old to this day is still an unknown factor to all of us. To me, it's inevitably unimaginable knowing the fact that underneath the existence of Amnesty International and well-educated and knowledgeable leaders of the CCP and including the human era of consciousness, people are still victimized for having their fundamental and religious beliefs like my grandfather, the Jitara Rinpoche. And on top of that, it's so ironic how China's law has clearly stated that everyone has a right for their own religious freedom, their faith to believe in. But yet, I don't know what it is that my grandfather and all the millions and billions of people in Tibet are forgetting in this concept. Therefore, growing up in a family where we always valued our Tibetan literature, our Tibetan language, and our Tibetan culture, due to the risk of extinction. I remember so vividly listening and just crying, hearing the stories of my grandfather and all of his sacrifices that it gave me the responsibility to keep asking the question on the well-being and the whereabouts of my own grandfather at a very, very old age. 
And therefore, this also led me to ask the question on how countries like China, very well, well educated countries like China, can develop artificial intelligence and create high advanced technology, but yet lack in the sense of human rights in regards of human kindness. And also, what will make us different from the AI in 100 years from now is our inner human consciousness. Therefore, it's so essential for everyone here on this panel of discussion, and as well as people who are watching this live video, and including um, the CCP to really play an essential role, role in the well-being and the whereabouts of my grandfather, the Chad Mbuche, and all of uh, His Holiness 11 Pension Lama's Research Committee. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sakina, you have to unmute. Thank you so much, Nangsala, for sharing uh, with us um, about your feelings regarding your grandfather, Chadu Rinpoche. And um, regarding that, uh, what message would you like to convey to the international community regarding uh, the search of the 11th Pension Lama? Well, I would like to drive the world's concern on the unjustified event that followed an innocent young boy at the age of six years old. His Holiness the 11th Pension Lama, the Gindi Chiginyama, and along with, his, along with his entire family was abducted and taken away three days after the recognition of His Holiness the 11th Pension Lama by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. This questions me how anyone can possibly abduct and imprison an innocent young boy at the age of six years old and yet also victimize Tibetan Buddhism and tra Tibetan traditions that we have been following for over hundreds of years, relating back to the 17th century. Therefore, it's so essential for the Chinese Communist Party, the well-educated and knowledgeable leaders for the Chinese Communist Party to play an immense role in being considerate in the well-being and the whereabouts of Our His Holiness, the 11th Pantan Lama, who plays such an essential and important role for our Tibetan Buddhism and our Tibetan traditions that we have been following for years and years. Though history is not written through the lenses of the minority. History itself has clearly shown that success would never last long if it was ever built on a suppressed foundation. And even today in this world, we can still see the chaos, the war, the crime due to the injustice in the system that's caused by it. Our, our living Buddha, His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, has always taught and remembered that we can solve a problem by our genuine human understanding, our consciousness, as well as our resilient mindset to a broad perspective and including dialogue and not through hate, crime or war. Therefore, I would like to ask the Amnesty International, UN Watch, United Nations, as well as all of today's panel discussion members, and including the Chinese Communist Party, to help them find the well-being and the whereabouts of His Holiness the 11th Pension Lama, and including his whole entire research committee, as well as his own family, um, and to also reassure us the safeguard of our Tibetan traditions, our Tibetan Buddhism, and our Tibetan culture that we've been following for years and years. And thank you so much for having me here on this panel discussion. And as well, um, long live His Holiness the 14 Dalai Lama. And I thank His Holiness the 14 Dalai Lama for always indoctrinating us the moral ethics and our human consciousness that we have all had today. So thank you. Um, Sakina, so if I may, you know, uh, seeing uh, Nancy Devala uh, speak so eloquently about her grandfather and uh, 11th Pension Lama, and especially about you know his solidness the great 14th dialogue of tibet i'm very encouraged you know um as for me i started uh, the campaign or participation in release the pension lama actually in 1990 itself after the death of the 10th pension lama we all suspected he was poisoned and i was a youth congress leader uh, and we went with uh, Rajiv in Delhi with Molotov cocktail and did few things I don't want to mention in the, at the Chinese embassy. And I landed up in Tihar jail, the notorious you know, national prison of uh, India uh, for more than a week or so. And since 1990, now it's been 33 years, and you know, I've always been speaking out, uh, uh, you know, at, at, at least every year if possible. You know, I've been uh, in other campaigns as well. So, uh, you know, to, we have to pass the torch to new generations. So we have someone from Chaturimuchi's family here 
you know. Um, so young, articulate, you know, uh, uh, Nangsela speaking. And uh, Rajiv has been with us for more than 40 years, you know. And obviously, you know, uh, uh, friends like Rajiv and Garnet and, you know, uh, Nuri Takul, and they all speak uh, for us. And we will do the best we can, you know, uh, for the release of Levin Pension Lama and Chajir uh, But uh, Nangsala, and you should carry on the torch and, you know, camping and travel because you have a personal testimony which is more powerful than any of our testimonies because we are secondary voices, you know. So uh, so the Asia Freedom Institute in the Freedom Hour, so we have uh, uh, amidst all the sad news of, you know, uh, Prince Lama's birthday not able to celebrate and disappearance for many decades, we have, uh, you know, um, shining light uh, in new generation who will advocate for, for the cause of Tibet, you know. And for Pinchin Lama and Chedrum Bashir. So this is a good thing we did today, yeah. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Sister La, for your <clears throat> feedback. And uh, thank you so much, Nansula, for speaking so well. And I agree with Sister La that you know you should carry the torch because you belong from the Chedrum Bashir family. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. And um, it was really, really nice having you all here. And uh, Sister Lofsan Singila, it's so nice to have you here. Um, make you know, it's always so good to be sharing the screen with you. You always bring uh, so much of a lively, like, you know, energy, uh, no matter on what topic we talk about. And Rajiv, it was so nice to have you here till the very end. It was uh, really interesting, whatever you spoke uh, regarding the 11th Pension Lama. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank... Um, the technicians who are uh, handling all the technical aspects of this discussion in the background and everyone involved um, uh, for this discussion. And I would also like to thank Garnet. And uh, it was so nice to have Bob uh, giving us the surprise uh, appearance. And uh, we wish him a speedy recovery. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Zikia Brimbuche and Yuri Turkel. If Even if they were not here, they managed to uh, send us their uh, piece. Um, on the 11th Pension Lama. Now I'd like to um, hand over to Kedola for the concluding remark. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sakina. And uh, yeah, I just want to echo everything that was said uh, before this, uh, thank, thanking all the speakers and especially the, uh, the video messages. And also it was just uh, really touching to see Bob checking in, even though he's really you know not feeling well. Uh, I just wanted to conclude with, uh, with this very short kind of uh, I guess reassurance that you know the issue of uh, the eleven Panchalama is really really critical. Even though so many years have passed, and it's it's a it's a very tough, difficult campaign, but uh, we just can't give up. And uh, and those of us uh, at the Asia Freedom Institute, this is something that we plan to continue to press and work towards. Uh, and yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, the issue is very important, and in the in the weeks and months ahead, you know, we plan to do more research and uh, and continue to shed light and continue to put pressure on the Chinese government and uh, and, and and the international community to really uh, kind of provide support and, and and more attention to this very important issue. So, with that, I want to thank everybody, and this has been a wonderful session. And uh, and lastly, uh, thanks to all the viewers as well. So, uh, thank you, everyone. Um. Yeah, so uh, before I end, the video of the session will be uploaded on Asia Freedom Institute's website at uh, www.asiafreedominstitute.org. And please follow Asia Freedom Institute's uh, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn pages for more information on Asia Freedom Institute's programs and activities. Thank you. Thank you to all our viewers as well. Thank you.